Hi, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this week's episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now on this week's program, we're joined by my uh, good friend and uh, ministry partner, Dalton Thomas. Uh, Dalton gives leadership to FAI, Frontier Alliance International. It's a, uh, it's a small missions organization as well as a movie production studio and uh, Dalton's been very busy uh, this year. We've been busy. Uh, have actually put out three films uh, this year. The first film uh, many of you watched was called Better Friends Than Mountains. So uh, during a ministry trip to northern Iraq, to Kurdistan, to um, visit with uh, the refugees there, uh, Dalton just blitzkrieg through the editing process in just a few weeks put out this uh, documentary called Better Friends and Mountains. And if you haven't seen that, I uh, would encourage you to, to watch that. And again, you can, you can watch it for free, uh, but you can also purchase the, uh, the extended bonus version online through Vimeo On Demand. And then uh, just a few months later, uh, they released Covenant and Controversy, The Great Rage, which is the first in a five-part film series that deals with the uh, enduring legacy of anti-Semitism, and now we've just released uh, the third film called Sheep Among Wolves, which is also the first in a series of films. So, <clears throat> Dalton, you've been busy. Uh, it's good to have you on with us. Uh, welcome to the Underground. Bro, it's good to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Well, listen, um, I just want to jump into this, this question. Uh, you know, FAI, again, is a missions organization. Uh, that's doing documentaries, that's doing films. And so I want to just address the question, why films? You know, obviously, everything is changing right now, not only in terms of uh, video and, uh, you know, film production technology, but information technology. The way most people are getting information, most of the younger generation, they're, not, they're barely watching TV anymore. They're getting most of their information through the Internet, through their phones, and so we really are in sort of this Gutenberg press moment. And, um, and so you've really sort of jumped into the fray to try to get ahead of the curve, so to speak. And because ultimately uh, our primary mission as disciples is to proclaim the gospel, to reach everyone, every tongue, tribe, people, and nation with the gospel. And so... <clears throat> you know, just trying to make the most of utilizing film and video media. Um, but go ahead and just jump in on your, you know, what's on your heart in terms of why, why are you making film such a priority? Why is a missions organization making film uh, such a priority in all that you're doing? Yeah, it, it um, I, I was never interested in film. I was never interested. Uh, it, it was not something that I grew up really caring about. It wasn't anything that mattered a lot to me. Uh, a number of years ago, I wrote uh, a number of books, and and one of the things that I felt in, in publishing the books was frustration uh, that our generation is not a reading culture. Um, because your average 22-year-old kid, I think, needs to grapple with some of these issues, but your average 22-year-old kid is likely not going to pick up a 200-page book and, and, and read about it. Which I totally get. Before I got saved, I didn't. I barely read captions in surf magazines. It wasn't something that uh, I didn't like reading. Uh, yet when I became a believer, I fell in love with eating, with reading, and wanted to to eat, devour the word. Um, and there was this abiding frustration of feeling that if if uh, if there's going to be a, a deep impact of the gospel in our generation, that refuses to read that that's that's problematic 
And so one day the penny dropped for me when it was actually studying church history in the Reformation period, um, particularly what happened during the time between Martin Luther and John Calvin's ministry in Europe. What happened, what a lot of people don't realize about the Reformation is that it wasn't just, you know, that some Augustinian monks stumbled on, you know, the doctrine of justification. You also had three massive discoveries during that season of time. You had the invention of the printing press, you had the invention of the compass, and you had the invention of gunpowder, which we go, boring, not really. At that time, you know, the printing press, the compass, gunpowder, that changed everything. And so the way that you, you read a lot of stuff that was coming out in terms of the, the intention of the reformers to expand the gospel into every tribe, tongue, and nation, they believed it was possible because the printing press now enabled them to print the gospel into every language. All they had to do was translate it. The compass enabled them to go anywhere in the world and know where they were going. Gunpowder, obviously, uh, you know, hunting, protection, whatever you want to say about that. But those were three big uh, discoveries, inventions that really... Uh, set the context for the advance of the gospel in a way that wasn't possible before that. And the penny dropped for me when I, I, I realized that, you know, it, it's silly to sit around getting frustrated at your buddies who won't read, but they'll stream 52 shows on Netflix and Amazon over the weekend and realizing that it's a pulpit. It's a platform. It is not, I don't think it can replace uh, reading and writing, because I think that's a unique, invaluable platform. But having said that, I think w through film, you can provoke, um, you can catalyze things through film that you couldn't through through just the medium of writing. And I think for me, something clicked when I realized that through film, you're you're uh, really combining the medium of preaching and teaching, the uh, the art of, of writing in the sense of deliberate articulation of thought and ideas with the beauty of sound and color and images. And it, it, it really, it, it just struck me one day of this is such a powerful medium. And I think I was really reactionary to film for a long time because I saw so much of the Christian film industry was, um, I think, uh, beneath the intentions of God, I'll say it that way, um, in the sense of uh, dabbling in things that I think weren't necessarily, uh, it wasn't magnifying the gospel, put it that way. And so I, I you know, I would see these big, you know, blockbuster films come out under a, a Christian uh, a banner and think, I don't, I don't want to do that, so I don't like film, because I think that is not... Um, a faithful representation of, of the gospel, and I don't, you know, there was a sense that it was it was reactionary, really, and the Lord really confronted me on it and said, "This is a pulpit, this is a platform, and it's not something that you can take lightly." And so, uh, we we picked up cameras w without any intention of ever picking them up, and we picked them up with the intention of. Uh, doing it as writers, as preachers, as teachers, not necessarily as filmmakers. I've come to appreciate the art of filmmaking, but I think still I'm mostly mostly a preacher teacher who uh, values the visual medium now. And I think it's a, uh, you know, I don't really have uh, interest in making films, to be honest, but I have a, a lot of energy and burden about communic communicating things in a faithful, articulate way, exposing people to things that they can't see, um, in in their environment, in their context, grappling with things that I think are uh, transcend our immediate, you know, locations and vocations, and thinking outside of that, and in uh, uh, communicating um, th communicating in a spirit of prophecy what we would from pulpits or books, but just doing it with a visual medium, with the hopes that. There would be a, a hunger and a desire because my you know my conviction about film is that films can't change the world but they can provoke and catalyze things they can do things and start things to get people thinking and moving in directions it would make me sad if we just made uh, beautiful films and people said oh those are beautiful films um, that sounds really depressing <laughs> to me uh, my my intention would be that it would convict and provoke a response and that you know. A, uh, we would see Jesus a little more clearly, love him a little more deeply, and obey him a bit more unreservedly because of it. And so film to me, that, that, it, is a, it is a pulpit, and, I, and I, I see it as that. Yeah, I mean, this is the, 
this is the thing as me personally, uh, you know, as a minister, I'm probably most known uh, for being a, a teacher of the end times. And okay, I understand that and I value that. And I, I think focusing on the return of Jesus and the signs that surround his return are important. But one of the convictions that's really gripped me the past several years is that if this stuff is mere information, you know, it's worthless. It's just, I, I joke, I call it morbid trivia. You know, which nations are going to invade which nations and, you know, what's the ethnicity of the Antichrist and all these things. However, if there's application unto the gospel, which I believe is how the early church related to the issue of biblical prophecy, the testimony of the prophets, yeah. then the stuff is profound. And so this has really been my heart. You know, you brought up the issue of what took place during the Reformation, the Gutenberg press, how that impacted the world. And I know that you're on board with me. My heart is to uh, provoke, and, and maybe this is a little sensational to say it this way, but to provoke a revolution. I mean, I, I look at... I look at the, you know, the kids of our generation, like you said, the 22-year-olds, and, and it's not just the 22-year-olds. I mean, it's, it's everyone. Walk through an airport sometime, but we're just scrolling through our phones, you know, just sort of, you know, it's amazing how, you know, I, you know, I joke, I quit. I, I did Instagram for, I don't know, several months, a couple years ago, and I quit Instagram because I realized that if I'm just flipping through pay, pictures, of Instagram, other people's pictures, my pictures, for 15 minutes a day. By the end of the year, I've just wasted like one or two full work weeks of my year. I'm going, what could I have done with a full work week? Now, again, I believe social media, you know, it, it has its place. But the point is this, is that we're, as a culture, we're wasting our lives. And so I just so desire to see people reclaim the time that we have because the time is short. Uh, you know, our time is limited and I want to, I want to see kids rise up to take up the challenge and the call of the gospel. And so I know that's one of the reasons I'm pushing for these things. I'm right on board with you in terms of proclaiming the gospel and just simply using this medium to proclaim the gospel, hopefully to inspire another reformation and ideally back to uh, frontier missions and really the, the front line of what God's doing in the earth, which sort of leads to the next point that I wanted to touch on. In the film, Sheep Among Wolves, uh, you make a statement about essentially uh, kicking the dust off of our feet here in the Western world in the United States and Australia, New Zealand, and going to the part of the world where the Lord is uh, objectively uh, demonstrably moving right now. And so obviously the, she, the, the film, Sheep Among Wolves, is about the underground church in the Middle East. And this is, this is a hot topic right now. We're just coming off of, we had the, the massacre in California, we had the massacre in Paris, um, the, 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 the Syrian refugee crisis. I mean, this is fresh on everybody's mind right now. And everyone is increasingly concerned and upset about Muslim immigration. And again, I'm the Islamic Antichrist guy. Nobody's going to accuse me of being naive concerning, uh, you know, the, the demonic roots of Islam. But here we are in the midst of all of this, calling people to love Muslims, to lay down their lives for Muslims, to go to the Islamic world, uh, we've been focusing primarily on the Arab and Persian world, but just touch on this, you know, because, you know, obviously here in the West, we are increasingly a, not just a, not just a post-Christian culture, we're becoming a post, you know, a post-God culture to where it's just, it's popular now just to, to mock the concept of God, you know, on social media, people say, well, you go ahead and you, you keep praying to your sky wizard, you know, the old man in the sky and see if he hears you and, it's just, it's, it's becoming normal culture to mock prayer, to mock God. And, you know, at what point do we, as Jesus said, when you are rejected, when you are, the message is no longer welcome, you kick the dust off your feet and you go to those who are receiving the gospel. This is a big part of what we're, um, we're proclaiming in the film. Uh, go ahead and jump into that, uh, just that issue, if, if you could. Yeah, I think... You know, full disclosure, I'm a uh, conservative, right-leaning, 
would-be Republican voting guy. So this isn't coming from a place of um, a political uh, bias or bent here when I say this. But um, recently, you know, I think with all of the recent, uh, you know, explosions of violence all over the world and different, uh, both on American soil and overseas, I've been increasingly f uh, burdened and frustrated by what I'm seeing come out of American conservative evangelicalism in the sense of the predominant cultural reality that I'm seeing right now is the whole issue of self-preservation. And when I look at the gospel and I ask the question, this man who was crucified on Roman crossbeams, who bled out, who was buried in a borrowed grave, who rose from the dead, and then promised to return and to establish a government on the earth, to rule with a rod of iron, to make all things new, to make all things right, to make all things pure, and all things good, and all things holy. And then I look at our attempt to establish some sort of uh, American theocracy sort of thing, with or without a high view of God, um, I feel increasingly concerned for the trajectory of our nation. And I mean, what I mean by that is this. If our primary concern is to protect our, our culture, to protect our, ourselves, our families, our bodies, our homes, our cultural identity, our, our, uh, if, if that's our priority and not following and uh, uh, heeding the priorities of that man who hung on that cross... Uh, we may not actually be followers of that man on that cross. And I think uh, that is where the Lord is pressing the church in America right now is to deal with that question of, do, are you first an American Republican or Democrat, or are you first a follower of Jesus, the crucified Lamb of God? And that is a, a question we're all going to have to answer. That doesn't mean that there's... Uh, we're, we're apolitical. It doesn't mean that there's not political decisions to make, that we reject politics or anything like that. What it means is that we subject our politics to the main and plain teachings of Jesus in Scripture. And when Jesus says certain things like, go into all nations and proclaim the gospel, and then the end will come, um, if we don't prioritize it, he did not give a caveat and say, you know, go into all nations except for the ones who don't want you. He didn't say go into all nations except for Islamic nations, and he didn't. He didn't say receive the sojourner, the alien, the widow, and the orphan unless they're Muslims, because they could potentially be jihadis. He didn't add these qualifications that we're adding right now, and that burdens me. And so when I look out over the, you know, depending on how you count, 1.6 billion Muslims, roughly 85 percent of them are considered unreached and unengaged. And when I look at our nation that's had the gospel for centuries, we are a church-saturated nation. I think. It, it, if if we have had this witness for this long and we have this much access to the gospel, what do, do we really care about the gospel if we look at that many people who have no access to it and say it's more important to defend our American cultural identity than it is to go lay our lives down for those people who have no access to it? And a common criticism of this kind of thinking is, well, Dalton, there's lost people here. There's unreached people here. And I would say, yeah, absolutely. My neighbors right now, I'm, I'm willing to go out on a ledge here and say that they have probably do not love the Lord. Um, they are unreached. They need to hear the gospel. But here's the difference. My unsaved neighbor here has access to the gospel where the guy in the Arabian Peninsula doesn't. And so I think, you know, if we're going to start thinking biblically and in a, in a way that honors the wonder of the person and work of Jesus and who he is and what he's worth, um, I think we need to really start grappling with this question of unengaged peoples and the, the uh, biblical, uh, the, the weight of the biblical command to go into all nations and to uh, prioritize those who don't have access to the gospel because I just think I don't have a right because a lot of people say this, well I'm not called to me it's not an issue of personal calling I don't look at the issue and go I feel called I look at the Bible and say here's biblical commands and then I look at uh, barren harvest fields and church saturated nations and I go forget my calling look at that you know, and I think we Americans think so individualistic. We think so, what is my destiny and my calling? And I think we need to start thinking more in terms of what does the Bible say and what's happening on the earth right now, not what is my calling and my identity and my gifting. Now, there is a place for calling, identity, and gifting, for sure. I just think we can't elevate our own perception of our subjective calling over biblical commands to go into all nations and proclaim the gospel where it hasn't been proclaimed. Because... 
lack of access to the gospel, in my mind, is the greatest injustice in our generation, which means we need to prioritize alleviating that injustice, which is proclaiming the gospel where it has not been proclaimed before. Right. You know, when you think of, you say, um, you know, somebody uh, grows up in Istanbul and they have three children and they have little babies, and you think their possibility of hearing a faithful testimony, a faithful explanation of the gospel is so incredibly slim. Their chances of knowing a Christian who is going to demonstrate and live and, and be a Christian and share the gospel with them is so slim. That is a profound injustice that there is a, a very solid statistical, I mean, a, a high probable chance that those little children, those beautiful little babies will die without ever having the, the option to choose Jesus. That's an injustice that needs to be confronted by this generation. Say, we will not stand while this injustice is, uh, is a reality in so many parts of the world. Now, um, because the reality is right now, and this is, this is a hard paradigm, a hard paradox for a lot of people to grasp. Because so many here in the West are just filled with just all of the negative images of Islam. And again, uh, Islam, you know, as an ideology, it is a killing machine. And it's, it's wiping out people all across the earth. But the reality is also there that the Islamic world and, and, and in every sphere of the Islamic world, whether we're talking the Arabian part of the world, the Persian world, East Africa, West Africa, you name it. Any sphere of the Islamic world right now is seeing more Muslims come to faith in Jesus, they're becoming disciples of Jesus, than at any other time in the past 13, 1400 years. In the whole history of Islam, we are seeing a revival in that part of the world. So if this is where God's moving, if God's moving in the Islamic world, and this is really what we're saying is, why are we expending so much of our resources, so much of our prayers, so much of our energy toward preserving and protecting culture here back in the United States when we could be participating in this great end time harvest and revival that's sweeping the Middle East. And, and this is really the focus of the film, Sheep Among Wolves. You know, we're not going all over, all over the Islamic world. We're not going to Indonesia. We're not in Pakistan. We're not in West Africa. We're focusing on the Arab and Persian world. Uh, but there's a harvest taking place there. So, I mean, this is, this is wisdom. This is simple wisdom. We, are, we want to maximize the little bit of time, the little bit of energy, the little bit of money we have. We want to maximize and use that to the, to the best that we can to see fruit multiplied. And so this is one of the messages that comes out of the film, and we've got some of those that are living and working uh, in the underground church there, in the Arab, in the Persian world, and they're saying, right now, in our country, it's the time of harvest. You know, we've been talking about Jesus for a long time now, but we are seeing people come to faith. And this is, this is sort of a, a part of the picture that a lot here in the West don't get a chance to see. And so we're trying to give people a chance just to peer into that which they don't often get a chance to see. And, and, and then you and I and others uh, have the, the blessing and the privilege to be able to put our faces on camera and represent those that can't do that because if they do they'll be killed and so you know this is um, I think it's an important message to it, it's another side of the picture in terms of what everybody's seeing in the news One of the greatest pitfalls, Jesus said, of the last days is that the love of most will grow cold. And I already see, I see a lot of my Christian brothers and sisters 
and their love is growing cold and they are allowing hatred and prejudice to creep into their hearts and they speak of Muslims, they speak of the Middle East with hatred in their heart. They say things, I see some of the most grotesque things said in the name of Christianity. They say, well, the only solution is to reduce the Middle East to a sea of glass or the only solution is nuclear in nature. For me, when I look at ISIS, when I realize they're a couple of hours away, when, when you know, everyone's friends, uh, people send you emails, uh, this is the latest crazy thing ISIS is doing, and, and in a way that there's the temptation to just um, want to be more and more enraged, more and more hate ISIS, and of course the ideology, the, the evil behind it does just make you sick to your stomach. But... To know that I'm still called to love my enemy and what does that mean when I look at ISIS, when I look at what they're doing to, to friends and family around us, how can I call myself a believer if I'm not praying for them? Do you think Jesus saved you because you are better than Muslims? Jesus didn't save you or me because we are one drop better than the most vile terrorist in the earth. He saved you and me out of mercy and grace. And we, are, we claim to proclaim the gospel of mercy and grace. And if we want to navigate the days ahead in obedience to Jesus, then there's no room for prejudice, there's no room for hatred, there's no room for this tribalism, this us versus them. God is a father who loves his enemies. He is patient and kind and merciful toward his enemies, toward those that hate him. When Jesus died on the cross, this was the very essence of showing mercy to his enemies. And he says, you imitate me. You also likewise show mercy and grace toward your enemies. And in the days ahead, the Lord is going to turn the body of Christ he is going to turn his people over to be persecuted as a witness to the nations, as a witness to his mercy and grace. And this is, these are our only choices. We can choose to be ambassadors of Jesus or we can choose to let our love grow cold and retreat into this tribalism and this hatred. But if you truly want to be a follower of Jesus, there's really no choices there.